So let us start proper. Oh, and I forgot. If you have any questions at any point in time, please do stop me, and I will answer them as to, my, to the best of my abilities. Cool. Okay, so this is basically what we'll be going through today. Um, yeah, you can take a look at it yourself. So to start proper, we'll be going through anatomy. So you'll be covering diaphragm, pleura, lung, mediastinum, and the esophagus. I will not be covering the chest wall or the MS or the neurovasculature of the chest wall. Okay, so we start off with the diaphragm. So just certain things that you need to get your head around. You have three parts to your diaphragm, it's your sternal, costal, and lumbar. You have two crew of your diaphragm, the left and right, vasculature, your superior and inferior phrenic arteries. Um, these are the kind of the things that are not as important for your examinations, so just keep it at the back of your mind. The innovation, however, is really, really important. So be sure to note that um, the motor innovation of the diaphragm is done by your phrenic nerve. So I'm sure you know C345 keeps the diaphragm alive. Yes? Yeah. Familiar? Familiar? Cool. Okay, and the sensory portion is the intercostal nerve and the phrenic nerve. So I'll be going through in more detail the innovation in later slides, um, but keep this in the back of your mind for now. Okay. So these are the important apertures of your diaphragm. You have your caval opening, esophageal hiatus, and the aortic hiatus. So did anyone teach you of the alphabetical way to count this? Yes, that's good. I see some nods. So the vena cava has eight letters, hence you find it at T8. Esophageal, the UK spelling, not the US spelling. We had some people who thought it was T9. So remember, UK spelling, you're in Australia. So esophageal. esophageal is T10, and aortic hiatus, two words together, forms 12 letters, so T12. And these are basically the things that go through your hiatus. And these are some of the others which also exist but aren't too important. Okay, cool. So these are some of the clinical relevance for your diaphragm. So if you have a phrenic nerve section, which is a cut to your phrenic nerve or damage to your phrenic nerve, it can result in complete paralysis of the ipsilateral diaphragm, so the diaphragm on the same side. So when you see this on the chest x-ray, what you would see is a elevated hemidiaphragm. So your diaphragm will look more concave. It will look elevated because that's the resting position of your diaphragm. Okay? And I'll cover referred pain later. Cool. So pleural anatomy. Okay, so your pleura is made out of two continuous membranes, your visceral and parietal pleura. And these two pleura are continuous at the hilum of the lung. Anyone has any issues with the um, concept of the continuous membrane forming the visceral and parietal pleura? It's quite similar to that of your pericardium over your heart. So basically, you have, imagine a sheet of paper, your, your lung is basically penetrating inside and forming two layers. And this is continuous at the hilum of the lung. So your pleura, importantly, this is important, extends two to three centimeters above the medial clavicle until the ribs eight, 10, and 12. So this is your rule of twos. So the mid-clavicular line, axillary line, and the uh, posterior line as well. And take note that the lung is two ribs above that of the pleura. So the lungs will be six, eight, and 10, whereas pleura will be eight, 10, and 12, okay? So this is just a diagram to illustrate that. So the pleural cavity contains pleural fluid, and the parietal pleura consists of three parts, and these are lines of pleural reflection. So basically, I just want you to realize that um, these anatomical definitions of the three parts of the parietal pleura and the lines of pleural reflection are not too important, um, unless on a chest x-ray for the lines of pleural reflection. But to be very honest, no one in the hospital actually goes by, oh, look at that line of pleural reflection. They just go, look at the bottom of the lung. Yeah. So you have the sternal, costal, and vertebral, and I've written the definitions there for you to read in your free time. Cool. So basically how I've organized this lecture is to give you the anatomy and then give you the clinical relevance immediately after the anatomy. So I hope that helps you correlate the two easier. So the first we'll start off with pneumothorax. Can anyone tell me what a pneumothorax is? Uh, yeah, cavity. Yes, okay. So that's right. So you have air in the pleural cavity. Here you go, you have a chocolate. 
Oops. <laughs> okay. So yes, a pneumothorax is air in the pleural cavity. And to link it back to the anatomical concepts, you need to have a concept of the pleural cavity, and you need to know the areas to which the, plural, the pleura is vulnerable to injury. So like we said, it extends two to three centimeters above the medial clavicle. It's also at the right infrasternal angle. So basically, do I have an image for this? No. Um, the right lung is bigger than the left lung. So the right lung tends to extend a little bit further out at the bottom of your sternum, here. Okay? And the other point of injury is the right and left costal vertebral angles. So this is just behind. It is just inferior to your 12th rib, rib 12. So there are three areas, I repeat, two to three centimeters above the medial clavicle, the right infrasternal angle, and the right and left costal vertebral angles. And so the classic Monash risk factor for pneumothorax is a tall, young, male basketball player. But trust me, this never actually happens in real life. Well, it does, but really rarely. And these are the main etiologies. So you can have trauma, so there's anything on the outside that causes air to flow in. And you can also have rupture of a pulmonary lesion. So basically, just think of this as if you have too much pressure in your lungs, basically, you have a rupture from the inside and not the outside. So clinical features include dyspnea, so that's shortness of breath, pleuritic chest pain, which means um, chest pain, which is worse on breathing. And you get hyperresonance because you have um, air trapped in your lung. And so therefore, you get reduced breath sounds and expansion on your its lateral side as well. On a chest x-ray, you might see atelectasis. Atelectasis is the collapse of the lung. And you might, you might see a shift in the mediastinal or you might not. If you see a shift, it's going to shift towards the side of the pneumothorax, okay? And this is in contrast to the tension pneumothorax. So the treatment of the pneumothorax is to insert a chest tube in the fifth to sixth intercostal space in the mid-axillary line, pointed superiorly. So you count ribs from five to six in the mid-axillary line, so in the armpit line. And you must point it superiorly because air floats up. Yeah. And note that hydrothoraxis, which is water in the lungs, uh, in the pleural space, you put in the same spot, but you point it down because water goes down. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And that is just some revision from last year. Chest drains must be inserted above the bottom rib to avoid damaging the intercostal nerves which travel under the um, inferior surface of the rib. Okay, so the next thing which is a bit more uh, important is tension pneumothorax. So pneumothorax is not an emergency. Tension pneumothorax is an emergency because of the different pathophysiology behind it. So in tension pneumothorax, you have a flat valve mechanism. Basically, the air can flow into the lung, but it cannot get out. Whereas in, in a normal pneumothorax, air can flow both in and out. So therefore, in a tension pneumothorax, you have a buildup of pressure in your pleural cavity, and this can lead to a few drastic effects, such as pushing your heart to one side, pressing the great vessels, causing hypotension, causing you to, well, basically um, become hemodynamically unstable. So signs and symptoms, basically, is the same as pneumothorax, but patient is more unwell. You have a deviated trachea and apex, so if you put your three fingers over your trachea, you can feel a deviated trachea. And this is usually away from the affected side, so think of it as the air on the affected side is pushing the trachea to the other side. And you have hemidiaphragm depression, so if you look at this chest x-ray, note that there's a bit of a depression of this hemidiaphragm here, it's not as high as on this side. And you can see the trachea has been deviated to the left side. That's here. So pneumothorax is here. And you can see that the blackness, which is basically the air in the lung, is represented in this chest x-ray as well. So the treatment for pneumotho tension pneumothorax is in the second intercostal space, mid-clavicular line. So like we mentioned earlier, the pneumothorax is in the fifth to sixth, in the mid-axillary line, so that's the armpit line. Whereas pneum tension pneumothorax is in the second space, in the mid-clavicular line. And the reason for this is because this is more accessible. This is an emergency, you want to treat it early. So the second intercostal space in the midclavicular line is much easier than rotating the patient, counting down to the fifth to sixth space, and inserting it in the mid axillary line. Um, however, do note that in the clinics itself, a lot of doctors actually do insert the chest tubes in the fifth to sixth mid axillary line as well. But for the sake of exams, just remember second intercostal space, midclavicular line. 
Okay, so now we move on to pleural effusion. So it's quite similar in concept to hydrothorax, just that pleural effusion can have a few types. Um, clinical features wise, you're most patients are actually asymptomatic, so they have no signs of it. They might have dyspnea, some pleuritic chest pain, but the best way to find a um, pleural effusion is to tap it. So you can find a stony downer, some percussion, that's the classic sign for pleural effusion, forgot to put it in there. Um, and on chest x-rays, what you will see is a loss of the costal diaphragmatic angle. So if you see on this side, it's nice and sharp. On this side, you don't see anything on, on the costal diaphragmatic angle. You can see a meniscus sign, which is this nice um, loop here. And you get a whiteout of the lung, which is this part underneath. So you have a pleural effusion until this portion right here. So the treatment is quite similar to that of a pneumothorax. You insert a chest drain in the 5th to 6th intercostal space mid-axillary line. This time you point it downwards or inferiorly. So pleural pain is the next thing I'll be going through. Um, to link it back to the anatomo anatomical concepts, the visceral pleura is innervated by your nociceptive afferent fibers. So this is quite a misnomer. It's quite a bad naming um, strategy because Although it says nociceptive, which indicates pain, these fibers do not actually carry pain, okay? And the parietal pleura is innervated by intercostal nerves, which innervate the peripheral of your diaphragm and the costal parts of the uh, pleura as well. Well, the phrenic nerve innervates the central part of your diaphragmatic pleura. So this is important when you see the signs in the patient and you find the pain in the patient and you want to tell where the actual irritation is. So when you have pleural pain, you have two types of pain. You have local and referred pain. So local pain is at the site of irritation, whereas referred pain, basically, the pain is referred to the um, thoracic and abdominal walls. So that is usually in the case of the costal and peripheral diaphragmatic pleura, so the intercostal nerves. Intercostal nerves supply your thoracic and abdominal walls. So if you have an irritation in that area or in the peripheral diaphragm, um, the pain will be referred there. Another area that pain can be referred to is the root of the neck and over the shoulder. So this, sets, um, this is done by your phrenic nerve, which innervates C345, which also happens to innervate the shoulder and medial arm as well. Cool. So going through some lung anatomy, the lung extends on 6, 8, 10, as I mentioned earlier. Right lobe has three lungs, left lobe two lungs, two lobes, left lung two lobes. So basically, sometimes I forget how you remember this. Trust me, after a while, sometimes you might wonder, is it the left or the right? So how you remember this, um, basically your left lung has to accommodate the heart. So the heart is taking up some space. So the left lung has less space in a sense, and you only have two lobes. Whereas the right lung has no heart on the right side, and you have three lobes. So um, similarly, you have one fissure on the left lung because you have two lobes and you have two fissures in your right lung because you have three lobes. So you have three surfaces, costal, mediastinal, diaphragmatic, three borders, anterior, inferior, posterior. Frankly, not really that important. And these are some of the lung impressions. Of note, the cardiac impression and the aortic impression are the more important ones. The others are good to know. So... Um, Okay. If you see this diagram here, notice how you can see, so this is the picture of a right lung. Notice how there are two fissures in the front of the lung and only one fissure at the back. And the diagram shows you why that's the case. So the tracheal bronchial tree, we have the right main bronchus, which is wider, shorter, and more vertical than the left. And this has implications for aspiration. Um, this is just how the bronchi flows from the main bronchi to the respiratory bronchioles. And each segment of bronchi supplies a bronchopulmonary segment. So there are many bronchopulmonary segments in your lung, of which you do not need to know the names of, because frankly, only your surgeons would know these names. Lung vasculature-wise, so your arteries and your veins. You have your bronchial arteries, which carry oxygenated blood, and pulmonary arteries, which carry deoxygenated blood. So remember that the um, pulmonary arteries uh, do not carry oxygenated blood. They carry deoxygenated blood from the right heart. And in, at the hilum, the pulmonary arteries are more superior. So this is the blue one here. And it's blue because it carries deoxygenated blood. 
and the pulmonary arteries follow the bronchi into the, the bronchopulmonary segments. So you contrast this with the veins. If you look at pulmonary veins, um, the veins run between bronchopulmonary segments and not following the bronchi into each segment. So just some um, stuff on the drainage. The bronchial veins may drain mainly the root of the lung, and the pulmonary veins drain the rest of the lung. And in the hilum, the superior and inferior pulmonary veins are anterior and inferior, respectively. So this image is quite important. They can give you this as a diagram and ask you to label it. So do try to remember this. OK, so lymph drainage, this actually came out before. Am I supposed to say that? But well, um, this is how it flows. Th this part is not too important. Basically, the one in red. So the hilar lymph nodes basically travel and they drain into the superior and inferior tracheal bronchial lymph nodes. The easier name for this is the carinal lymph nodes. So these lymph nodes are important in the spread of cancers. If you put a bronchoscope down and you see that the carina has been widened, you can um, um, suspect cancer from that. And from there, it goes into bronchomedostinal lymph nodes, the right or left thoracic duct. And I'm sure you are quite familiar with it, that the left side goes to the left, right side goes to the right. However, the lung has a little bit of an anomaly, which is really important because it has been tested before. So some of the left lower lobe drains into the right superior tracheal bronchial, which follows the right pathway. So basically, what I'm trying to say is the right lung drains to the right side, left lung drains mostly to the, right, to the left side, with the exception of the lower lobe of the left lung, which drains to both sides. So you got that? Lower lobe of the left lung drains to both sides. Yep. OK, so aspiration of foreign bodies, we link this back to anatomical concepts. We um, contrast the right and the left main bronchus anatomy. So there's a bit of a difference whether you aspirate while supine or whether you are erect. So when you're lying down, um, the foreign body tends to go to the superior segment of the inferior lobe of the right lung. Whereas when you're erect, it tends to go to the posterior basal segment of the inferior lobe of the right lung. So note that it's always the inferior lobe of the right lung, just that the segment changes. So when you're lying down, it goes to the superior segment, and this is because it's an early posterior branch. And when you're standing up, it goes to the posterior basal segment. And this is because that's the most vertical um, bronchus. So we move on to pulmonary embolism and deep vein thrombosis. So PEs, or pulmonary embolisms, usually arise from a VT in the pelvis or the legs. And these are the risk factors. So surgery, recent fracture, prolonged bed rest is an important one that they like to test. Long flights is another important one. And in year three, maybe you want to know about malignancies, pregnancies, and previous PEs. Um, pregnancy, you might want to note for a reproduction system when you learn it in SEM2, uh, but I'll just put it there for now. So some clinical features, you have pleuritic chest pain, dyspnea, and importantly, on an ECG, you have sinus tachycardia as well. That's the, one of the main features, among many others. And treatment-wise, um, yeah, you usually put them on anticoagulants, or you can put them on some thrombolysis as well. And this is how it goes. So the, the clot travels on the femoral vein, for example. It goes up into the right ventricle, gets pumped out to the lungs, and it gets stuck inside one of these pulmonary arteries. So when it gets stuck in these pulmonary arteries, it causes a bit of hypoxia in the region, and that's the symptoms, and that leads to symptoms of PE. So lung cancer. The main risk factor for lung cancer is smoking. And um, if you're in a rural setting, you might have biomass um, inhalation as well. So there's the burning of coal. And you can generally classify lung cancers into small or non-small cell lung carcinomas. So small cell carcinomas tend to be rarer, but they, are, they have a much worse prognosis. And non-small cells are more common, and they're more easy to treat. So it's quite fair. Clinical features-wise, there's a lot. Um, important for you to know to be anorexia, weight loss, and loss of appetite and fatigue. So these are your general systemic signs of cancer. You might have HPOA and clubbing. Uh, so HPOA is when you have pain in the wrist. 
and you might have supraclaviculate axillary lymphadenopathy. So this is when it metastasizes and goes into your lymph nodes in your supraclavicular region and axillary region. So important to note that you might have specific signs of pancose tumors. So pancose tumors are tumors at the apex of the lung, so at the top of the lung. And these tend to produce their own signs because at the apex of your lung, is, the anatomy is really tight. So it tends to compress on many structures in that region. Things you might press on is things like the ulnar nerve, of the brachial plexus, so you get atrophy of the intrinsic hand muscles of your hypothena and thena eminences, you get weakness of abduction, and you might get Horner's syndrome as well from compression of your sympathetic trunks. So the classic signs are meiosis, anhydrosis, and ptosis. You have hoarseness of voice, so that's compression of your recurrent laryngeal nerve. And you have SVC obstruction as well, which is compression of your um, superior vena cava. So these are the common sites of spread, not too important. Note the lymphatic drainage of the lung, especially the lower left lobe, because it's something that examiners like to test. So mediastinal anatomy, you have your superior and inferior mediastinum. You covered this last year in cardiac anatomy. So the superior and inferior mediastinum are separated by the thoracic plane. So that's the external angle or the angle of Lewis, which starts from your sternum at the um, little bump there, until T4, T5 IV disc. So these are the contents of your superior mediastinum from anterior to posterior. You have your thymus, your veins, your arteries, airways, esophagus, and your lymphatic chunks. I will put this to memory if I were you because um, from what I've heard, they've tested this before from my seniors, but for my year, I didn't think it, it came out. Inferior mediastinum, you have three parts to it, anterior, middle, posterior. They're separated by the pericardium. So in front of the pericardium, there's the anterior, inferior mediastinum, and that contains loose connective tissue and the thymus in young kids. In the middle, they have your heart, so I won't be going through that. Posterior, behind the uh, most posterior part of the pericardium, you have your thoracic aorta, thoracic duct, azygous and hemiazygous veins, esophagus, and all the other things are there as well. So, yep, this is just a diagram to illustrate that. So, the thoracic plane runs from the sternal angle of Lewis to a T4, T5 IV disc, like I mentioned earlier. This is just a eumonic for you guys to use to remember the contents. So, it stands for clap trap. And cardiac plexus, ligamentum arteriosum, aortic arch. So, note that the aortic arch is where, when you see it on, an, on a CT, it basically describes where the ascending aorta ends and where the descending aorta starts. So that's what you see. You, you don't actually see an arch, you see two holes, and that represents the arch, which is above it. Uh, you have the pulmonary trunk, the tracheal bifurcation, right to left, direction of thoracic duct, as gives veins during to FVC. The important ones that commonly are more important is your ligamentum arteriosum, the aortic arch, and the tracheal bifurcation. Okay. So this is your vagus and phrenic nerve anatomy. Um, important to note, the vagus nerve is always posterior to the phrenic nerve. So it runs behind, phrenic nerve in front. And the rest are not too important, except for the important branches. So the vagus nerve, each of them, the right and left, gives off a recurrent laryngeal nerve. And this is important because it supplies your vocal cords. Note that the right recurrent laryngeal nerve loops around the right subclavian artery, which is higher, whereas the left loops around your arch of the aorta at the ligamentum arteriosum, which is lower. And this is because of embryological reasons, where you actually lost an arch on the right side. So your um, nerve has to go one level higher to these subclavian artery. So important to note, um, many a times your recurrent laryngeal nerve is damaged by thyroid surgeries. So the thyroid is sitting right here at your neck, and many a times the surgery will cause damage to the recurrent laryngeal nerves and cause you to have a um, hoarse voice. Also, any sort of masses in the region like pancreas tumors or aneurysms can also cause this. Yes. So aortic dissection, I'm sure you guys are quite familiar with it, given that you were tested on it last year. So aortic dissection is when there's a sub tear in the aorta, causing blood to pool in a false lumen. So basically, you have the formation of two lumens inside your aorta. 
So the tail extends and the branches of the iota start occluding. So basically the further down you tear, the more branches of the iota that you might block off. Important ones to note are your renal arteries. So um, yeah. risk factors include Marfan's syndrome, age, male, pregnancy, trauma. And one very important one which I forgot to include there is hypertension as well. So clinical features, you have severe sudden tearing chest pain that radiates commonly to the back. Commonly because not all of them actually radiate to the back. So the ascending iota tends to refer pain more to the front. The descending iota, if it's torn, refers to the back. So you might have radio, radio delay, radio femoral delay. Um, patients might come in with AMI, stroke, acute renal failure. And this is basically because the tear has stopped the blood flow to your heart, to your brain, to your renal, uh, to your kidneys, and acute limb ischemia, where it stops blood flow to your legs. And so the treatment is usually immediate surgery, especially for the ascending aortic dissections. So we'll go through the esophagus now. I won't be going through the communication between the portal and systemic venous systems. That was something you will learn in an, um, actually learn now actually, in abdomen. So the esophagus is 25 centimeters in length. Uh, this is important because they like to test this. Um, other things in your body which are also 25 centimeters in length include your ureter, for example. So it's made of inner circular external longitudinal muscles. You can read this yourself. Um, the top one third is skeletal muscle, bottom one third is smooth muscle, and the middle one third is mixed between the two. So you have three constriction sites on fluoroscopy. So this is basically on an x-ray, you have three constriction sites on your esophagus. So at the top one is the upper esophageal sphincter. You have your cricopharyngeus muscle. You have your thoracic constriction. So if you were to look at your x-ray from an anterior posterior view, the thoracic constriction will be caused by the arch of the aorta. However, if you were to look at it from a lateral view, if you take a lateral x-ray, the thoracic constriction will be caused by the left main bronchus. So some people are confused because they think there are two constrictions, but actually it's just describing what you see on the chest x-ray and it's usually one. So you have a diaphragmatic constriction as well and that's due to the esophagus hiatus of the diaphragm. So you have two sphincters, your upper and lower, and the upper one's anatomical where you have a visible um, enlargement of the musculature around it, whereas the lower one is functional, and functional basically means you can't see an obvious um, thickening of the muscle around, and the reason it's a sphincter is due to increased tone of the muscle there. So now we contrast esophageal pain versus cardiac pain. So the heart refers pain to T2, T5, and T1. So basically this refers pain to the upper part of the chest and the medial arm. If you compare this with the esophagus, it refers pain to T4 to T6, and this is the lower anterior chest wall. So you might think, oh, so there's no confusion there. But a lot of patients in hospital actually present very vaguely. Um, any chest pain is just regarded as a general thing. They don't actually make the demarcation between lower or upper um, retrosternal pain. So there's a great degree of overlap, and esophageal pain tends to mimic cardiac pain. So we're we'll going to histology. So the respiratory epithelium covers the nasal cavity all the way to the bronchial tree. So I just want to make a distinction between the respiratory epithelium and the respiratory membrane. So the respiratory membrane participates in gas exchange. Respiratory epithelium does not participate in gas exchange. It is just the type of cells that are from your nose all the way to your terminal bronchioles. And classically, it is described as a pseudo-stratified ciliated columnar epithelium, which is another name for the respiratory epithelium. Um, it's pseudo-stratified because if you look here, you can see two layers of nuclei. But if you were to zoom up a little bit more, you can notice that all the cell membranes, even that of the top layer, are actually in communication with the basal lamina. However, if it was truly stratified, you'd have two layers of nuclei, and you'd have no communication of the top layer with the basal lamina. So pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium consists of ciliated columnar cells, like duh, and you have the goblet cells. So goblet cells are these white ones here, and they basically produce mucus to um, carry any debris up to the nose. And it's important to note that the debris is carried up from the lungs to your gullet, 
And in your nose, it travels backwards. So you don't get your nose pushing it out this way or you have a permanent running nose. So what you have is the nose will push it back, the lungs will push it up. And basically you swallow your mucus daily. And your basal cells are stem cells which produce and replace the layer on top. And you have this thing called Kaczynski cells or APAT cells which are not important for you right now. So we have conducting versus respiratory portions of your lung. Um, structural components, like I said, conducting portions to your nasal cavity, to your terminal bronchioles. Remember, terminal bronchioles are not the last bronchioles. You still have respiratory bronchioles after them. They just mark the end of the conducting portion. And they do not allow for gas exchange, I repeat. Um, so the cells are the pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium. So three things to note uh, for your respiratory portion. You have three places that participate in gas exchange. That is your respiratory bronchioles, your alveolar ducts, and your alveoli. Everyone clear? There's these three. And it's important that you recognize these three names. Really important. And there are two types of cells there. You have your type 1 pneumocytes. So these are simple and flat, so simple squamous. And they are flat so that you have less um, volume to travel through and you have, um, can facilitate diffusion of gas. Type 2 pneumocytes are cuboidal and they are used for surfactant production. So I don't like to memorize. I like to understand things behind the uh, concepts. Why is cuboidal? You need more organelles inside to produce surfactant, which is made up of proteins, made up of fats. And so if you think about it, type 1 pneumocytes need to be flat because they want to allow for faster diffusion. Type 2 pneumocytes are bigger because they need more organelles to produce these complex proteins to produce surfactant. So we move on to the trachea, bronchi, and bronchioles. The main thing I want to go through is the cartilage differences. So the trachea has C-shaped rings of hyaline cartilage, whereas your bronchi has plates of hyaline cartilage. Your bronchioles have no hyaline cartilage. So the rest are not as important. If you really want to know, you can refer to them. But the main thing that differentiates the three of them is the type of cartilage. So trachea, C-shaped, bronchi, plates, and bronchioles have no cartilage. Okay, so the alveoli, apart from type 1 and type 2 pneumocytes which I've already gone through, also um, consists of macrophages. So these break down osofactin and has immune function. In COPD, it might have a um, patho pathological function as well. What I want to um, get your attention to is the respiratory membrane. So like I said, this is in contrast to the respiratory epithelium. And it forms the air blood barrier. So basically, you'll be asked to describe how the respiratory membrane actually works and what are the layers that oxygen has to go through from the inside of the alveoli until it reaches the red blood cell. So it has to go through the surfactant, it has to go through type 1 pneumocytes, it has to go through the basal membranes. So there are usually two membranes, one membrane for your um, alveolar wall and one membrane for your endothelium, so that's the one that covers your um, blood vessels, but they are occasionally fused. You have your endothelial cell, you have to go through plasma, and finally you go to your red blood cell. So sometimes they can be a bit of an asshole. They can basically ask you how many cell membranes do I have to go through before I finally reach the red blood cell. So remember, if you go through a type 1 pneumocyte, that's two cell membranes. The endothelial cell does another two cell membranes. And red blood cell, you only go through one because you're already inside. You don't need to come out. <clears throat> so that's five. <clears throat> okay. So I'll be going to physiology. I like to think about it as pulmonary ventilation, perfusion, transport of O2 and CO2, and last of all, control of respiration. So this is a good framework to work by. And what, was it Dr. Fashad who took you guys this year? Yeah, he's good. So you guys should have a good understanding of this already. So a function of airways you, um, well, is there to allow for passageway of gases, air conditioning so you make it more humid, make it warmer, and for nation, of course, to speak. It also has defense mechanisms. So you have your mucociliary escalator, which is what I explained earlier. Your cilia pushes up the mucus for you to swallow. IgA is the immunoglobulin that's found in mucus, which helps to get rid of any of, of the uh, pathogens that is trapped in there. Macrophages, like I said, phagocytose, all the junk. So pulmonary ventilation, first I'll go through some definitions. 
Compliance is the, is the degree to which the lung expands given a unit increase in pressure. Okay? And elasticity is the total opposite of it. So high compliance equals low elasticity and, low, and high elasticity equals the low compliance. So you need to get your head around this because sometimes they like to switch the words and you need to know the definitions to understand what they're trying to say. So first and foremost, I want to um, emphasize the importance of the interaction of the lung and chest wall that the pleura have. So the pleura is not just hanging in between um, two layers. It's not just in between them. What is actually happening is the visceral pleura is super glued to the lung. Parietal pleura is super glued to the chest wall. So therefore, when these two move, you then have movement in your pleura. If it's not communicating, if it's not super glued to each of this, if your chest wall and lung move, your pleura will not move and you won't have any change in pressure and you will not have any air going in or out. Okay, so that's the first thing I want to highlight. So having understood that, um, there is a negative intrapleural pressure that's inside the pleura and this is maintained by a few things. So first, it's maintained by elastic forces. This is the main thing that's maintained by. And the other thing that you need to keep at the back of your mind, which is not too important, is that it is a sealed area. And there's an effect of lymphatics as well. So basically, if it's not sealed, you won't be able to maintain a negative intrapleural pressure because basically your air will just leak out, sorry, leak in to your pleura and you won't have a negative pressure. So it's important to note that it's a sealed area. So elastic forces, you have the contribution from your chest wall. So your chest wall naturally likes to expand, so it likes to push outwards. And that is just because that is the normal resting position of the bones and tissues in your body. So it likes to push out. Remember, chest wall out and lung pulls in. So your lung likes to collapse. And so I'll just elaborate more on the lung elastic forces. So you have forces, elastic forces, due to the interaction between surface tension and surfactant. And you also have contributions due to connective tissue, things like your elastin and all the um, connective tissue inside the lung. So connective tissue makes up one third of the total elastic forces, and the interaction between surface tension and surfactant produce two thirds of lung elastic forces. So surface tension is the attractive force between water molecules. So water molecules like to attract each other. And basically, when they pull too much, they basically cause your lung to collapse. So we need surfactant, which is secreted by type 2 pneumocytes, to do a few things. First and foremost, we need to increase lung compliance. We need to stabilize our alveoli. And the others are not too important. So basically, we increase lung compliance because... Um, Surfactant is uh, kind of like a soap. It's kind of like soap. What it does is that it reduces the attractive force between, surface, between the water molecules, and this reduces surface tension and reduces the elastic forces. So um, it decreases elasticity and it increases compliance. Hence, less pressure is required to expand the lung, but surface tension, even after the effect of surfactant, still makes up two-thirds of the total lung elastic forces. So that's just how strong surface tension actually is. So you can also stabilize the alveoli by... Um, so what happens in this case is you have large alveoli in the top of your lungs and you have small alveoli at the bottom of your lungs. And this is not because your alveoli have different number of cells. This is because the smaller ones at the bottom have more lung above them, so it presses them and makes them smaller. So if you were to think about it, they have the same number of type 2 pneumocytes in the small alveoli and the large alveoli. And you must be aware that smaller alveoli tend to collapse more easily, and this can be calculated by Laplace's equation. So Laplace's equation basically says that the smaller the spherical object, the more force it requires to keep it patent, which is open. And how we overcome this is to reduce surface tension more in the smaller alveoli. And this is because with the same number of type 2 pneumocytes, they produce the same amount of surfactant, but in a smaller alveoli, there's less surface area. So the concentration of surfactant is higher in the smaller alveoli, 
which helps to reduce surface tension to a greater extent in the smaller alveoli and therefore keep them patent. Did I lose anyone? Is that clear? Okay, so fluid accumulation in the alveoli, it prevents fluids from going into the alveoli as well, and this is because not just um, is it preventing the attractive forces between the water within the alveoli, it also prevents attractive forces between the blood vessels and the alveoli as well. So it doesn't pull water from the blood vessels into the alveoli and cause things like pulmonary edema. Okay, so only with this negative pressure, which is maintained by all these factors here, can your muscle action actually affect ventilation. So on inspiration, inspiration is a active process. Your diaphragm contracts, your external intercostal also contract. And what this basically does is that it causes an increase in volume. So at the same temperature, at 37 degrees body temperature, with an increase in volume, you will have a decrease in pressure. Okay? So with this decrease in pressure, it is reflected in a decreased intrapleural pressure, and this then reflects to a decreased alveolar pressure, which then pulls in air from the atmosphere into your lungs. It's very important to note that quiet expiration, which is expiration when you're seated, when you're not doing anything, is passive. So even a dead body can expire, and we actually tried this before. Someone in the lab actually blew up a cadaver's lung. Hmm. Yeah, it was quite gross. So, force expiration wise, we have to use accessory muscles. So that's the internal intercostal and your abdominal muscles and your sternocleidomastoid muscles as well. Okay, so this diagram here basically shows some diagrams um, which Monash wants you to know. So if you look at the lateral aspect of a person and you look at their upper ribs, it looks as if they have a pump handle movement. So um, this pump handle movement um, basically increases the anterior posterior diameter of the thorax. And if you look at the anterior posterior view, the lower ribs look as if they have a bucket handle movement. And this basically increases the transverse diameter. Um, I don't really know the, imp the reasons for knowing this, but it's just something that comes out. So this is the more important ones. So this diagram, the important diagrams are your orange one and your pink one, if you ask me. And there is only flow when lung volume is changing. So once it's changed with an ED, um, there is no flow. And apparently um, Fashad told us last year that he's quite anal about his grammar. So if you see your exam question asking you whether there's flow when lung volume has changed, the answer is no. But if it's changing, there is flow. So yeah, just to get to the nitty gritty grammar Nazi kind of details. Okay, so equilibrium points are at the beginning of inspiration and at the end of expiration only, at the point of functional residual capacity. Okay, FRC. I'll be going through this later in uh, lung volumes. So for now, just remember, there is no muscle action and there's total equilibrium between your chest wall and lung elastic forces at the start of inspiration and at the end of expiration, which is basically the same point in time. So this is hysteresis. hysteresis. Um, basically, it's the concept that at a certain pressure, there are different volumes of the lung. And I won't be going through this. You can read it in your free time. It's basically due to the way surfactant is stacked and how it interacts. So I'll be going through regional differences in ventilation. Important to note to yourself, ventilation is highest at the basis. That's why it's in red, in bold, and underlined. More ventilation at the basis. And this is due to the weight of the lung above. Like I told you, smaller alveoli at the bottom of the lung. So, you have smaller alveoli at the bottom of the lung due to the weight of the lung above and the one in grey due to the differences in geometry. But remember, because all alveoli have the same number of cells, their maximum size is the same. So even though they're smaller, that's just 10% of their filling size. The ones on top have maybe a seven, is seven, at 70% of their filling size. So they, the top one can only increase by another 30% before they hit 100. 
Whereas the small ones at the bottom, which are 10%, can increase by 90% to hit 100. So therefore, you have more ventilation at the basis of your lungs. Okay, so the small ones can have more room to expand, and therefore you have more ventilation at the bottom. Yep, so then hence, small at the bottom of the lung have more ventilation as they allow for greater change in size. Okay, yep, important point. So a slightly unrelated but equally important point, so this is not related to this at all, but the greatest airway resistance is in the medium-sized bronchioles, okay? So you might, you might question me and say, oh, but I thought that resistance is usually higher in the smaller bronchioles. Like, the smaller the radius, the higher the resistance. I mean, we learned that in, blood, in cardiac um, physiology. However, the reason for this is because, did you guys take physics? So basically, if you stack things in parallel, you tend to uh, reduce the, the resistance, whereas you put things in series, it tends to increase the resistance. And that's basically the understanding behind it. So partial pressures of gases, this is just the definition. So basically, if you have, per se, 50% of oxygen and 50% of carbon dioxide, 50% uh, the oxygen will take up 50% of the total um, pressures of the gases. So partial pressures of O2 and CO2 are controlled by a few things. The rate of use, the rate of absorption, alveolar ventilation. So it's quite... Um, um, easy to understand. When you hyperventilate, your PO2 rises and PCO2 decreases. When you hypoventilate, CO2 rises to a maximum of 45. Remember, it does not go any higher than 45. That's a very important point to note. It does not go higher than 45 uh, mmHg. And how water vapor comes into this? Because your lung is an open system, it's not closed. If you add water vapor, which is constantly in your lungs because it has mucus and it's moist, is moist in the lungs. At 37 degrees, pH2O is 47 mmHg. And because it's an open system, meaning that it interacts with atmospheric air, you cannot increase your airway pressure anything more than atmospheric air. So what water vapor does basically is reduces the percentage of oxygen and CO2 that makes up the air in your lung. Okay, so that's the understanding behind dilution. So these are the figures that you must memorize. I won't be going through them. You just need to burn this, burn it, drink it. Yeah. Okay. So I'll be going to pulmonary perfusion now. So the pulmonary circulation, okay, this part you can read yourself. This is just the um, actual reasoning as to why. Uh, what's important to note is the hypoxic vet pulmonary vasoconstriction response. So you need to contrast this with your systemic system. So pulmonary arterioles constrict when your PO2 is low, whereas your hypoxic response in systemic arterioles dilate. So the reason behind this is because in systemic arterioles, if you have a lack of oxygen, what do you want to do? You want to provide more blood to the area, so you dilate, you reduce resistance, and therefore more blood can flow to the area to provide more oxygen. However, in the lungs, if you have a region of hypoxia, you don't want to provide more blood to the area. What you want to do is to move the blood to somewhere else where it's more useful. So basically, you direct blood away from the hypoxic region by constriction. So you constrict the hypoxic sites, and basically blood flows to the more, um, to the more functional sites. So there are differences in perfusion as well. So like ventilation, Perfusion is also higher in the basis, so just remember both of them are higher at the basis. Um, and this is due to hydrostatic pressure differences within the blood vessels. So this uh, can be likened to diving. Um, if you go swimming in a swimming pool, the lower you go, the higher pressure you feel. And this is basically the same concept. So there's three zones, zone one, zone two, and zone three. Note that these are defined not anatomically, but defined by function. So this is in zone one, basically alveolar pressure is always higher than any pressure that your veins, sorry, your arteries can produce, and therefore they are always collapsed. The, the vessels are always collapsed, and there is no perfusion in this, re, in, this, in this zone. This does not usually occur in a normal lung. In zone two, your systolic blood pressure that comes from your right heart is higher than alveolar pressure but diastolic pressure is lower than alveolar pressure. 
so your vessels are intermittently open, so they kind of like open and close with each heartbeat. And this is normally found in the upper two-thirds of a normal lung in an erect patient, standing patient. Zone three, you have diastolic blood pressure always higher than alveolar pressure. So this is when vessels are always open, and this is normally found in the bottom one-third of your lung. Note that although I, I put the brackets bottom one-third, upper two-thirds, these things can change. So if the patient is lying down, everything changes. Okay? <clears throat> However, that being said, there's often a good correlation with anatomy. Okay. So now we're going to ventilation perfusion ratio, so the VP ratio. So this ratio basically reflects the matching between your ventilation and perfusion. So in an upright lung, both V and P are highest at the lung basis, like I told you earlier. However, the difference in perfusion is much larger than that of the ventilation at the bottom of the lung. Hence, your VP ratio is high at the apex and low at the basis. You can do the math and you can see that it is true. Okay. So what happens during exercise? During exercise, your, blood, um, your heart pumps harder. You basically open, uh, you increase the pressure in your vessels. So basically, you push things from zone 2 into zone 3 by increasing your diastolic blood pressure. So apart from that, you also breathe faster and you have greater alveolar ventilation as well. So not only do you have alveolar ventilation, which is increasing, but you also have increased diffusing capacity by improving the VP ratio by the respiratory membrane. <clears throat> so the next thing I'll be going through is the gas exchange between the alveoli and the blood. So red blood cells spend about 0 0.75 seconds and they finish their gas exchange by the first one third of the capillary. So this is quite important because they like to dump this random figures onto you guys. So remember 0 0.75 seconds in the first one third. And um, this allows for a greater reserve. So basically, you have more um, things, you have more reserve to play with if you ever need to um, absorb more oxygen. So these are the factors which affect the rate of diffusion, and this is really high school science, so I won't be going through it. Um, you might want to know membrane thickness can be caused by pulmonary edema and fibrosis, which leads to thickening, and thickening therefore um, slower diffusion. And this is important when you come to the understanding of TLCO and DLCO. So dead space. So first of all, I'd like to um, differentiate dead space from residual volume. So dead space is the volume of air which you breathe in that does not reach gas exchange areas. Okay? And residual volume basically is your end expiration and um, how much air is left in your lung. So this air that's left in your lung can possibly still um, participate in gas exchange. It's 19 hours. Whoops. And um, where was I? Um, yeah, so dead space basically does not take place, does not play a part in gas exchange, whereas residual volume is simply a defi by definition what you have left in your lung after you maximally ex expirate, expire. So it uh, can be understood in terms of physiological dead space, made up anatomical, so that's your nose, terminal bronchial, so this is normal, and non-functional dead space, which is due to poor VP ratio and is usually only found in pathology. So it normally is about 2.25 uh, 2 liters. So transport of O2 is mainly by hemoglobin, 98.5%. And this is the structure and function of hemoglobin. So you have four atoms per hemoglobin. And um, the number of atoms bound to O2 depends on partial pressure of oxygen. So it's important to note that with each oxygen bound, hemoglobin changes the shape to increase its affinity for the next O2 to bind. So just look at my hands. And let's say this was hemoglobin, this is oxygen. The first oxygen binds, and this requires the most energy to bind, okay? After this happens, hemoglobin changes its shape and uh, makes it easier for the, next for the next oxygen to bind. When the next oxygen binds, it changes shape again, and the next oxygen that binds to it it's even easier. It's even easier for the next one to bind. And then, last of all, it changes the shape, and the fourth oxygen that binds to it binds to it really, really, really easily. Okay? And this is important um, to understand the O2 hemoglobin dissociation curve. 
and is the basis for why hemoglobin has a high affinity for O2 in the lungs where PO2 is high. So when you have high PO2, there are more oxygen particles with sufficient energy to bind to the to make the first to make the first bond with hemoglobin. So this brings you back to high school um, chemistry. And because once the first O2 binds, it gets easier for the subsequent O2s to bind. Once the first one binds, you have a high affinity for the rest of the O2. And vice versa, that's the reason why you have low affinity when you have low PO2 as well. So hence, in a way, hemoglobin kind of reads the oxygen needs of tissues before releasing oxygen, which is, can also be described as their buffering capacity. And note that oxygen binds loosely and reversibly with iron, unlike carbon monoxide, which is permanent and a strong bond is formed. So this is the dissociation curve. So we're going a bit slower here because this is something that a lot of people have a bit of a cons uh, have misunderstandings about. So sigmoidal shape of this curve is due to the different O2 affinities of the four iron atoms in hemoglobin. Okay, so the buffering capacity. So basically, the buffering capacity describes this curve. So a decrease, for, so for example at 100 here, if you were to find the um, percentage saturation, that will give you maybe about 98% perhaps. So if I were to get a 10% reduction in my atmospheric PO2 to let's say 90, where's my mouse? Oh, there we go. You would only have, for example, 96%. So what this does is that instead of having a 10% drop in your percentage saturation because of your 10% drop in um, atmospheric PO2, it actually only leads to a 2% drop, so it lessens the decrease. So that's the buffer effect that it has. Conversely, if you have a small decrease in oxygen PO2, you have a large amount of O2 released. So this is, not really, uh, this is the buffer effect in reverse. So again, you can look at it here. If you have a large amount of O2 released by hemoglobin, so let's say from 40 to 10, you have a less amount of change in your percentage saturation of oxyhemoglobin. And this again is due to the fact that, um, that hemoglobin changes its shape with each subsequent oxygen that is bound to it. So these are the factors which shift the curve to the right. So, so far what we've only talked about is the points along the curve. Whereas in the next slide I'll be talking about things that shift the curves, okay? So the things that shift the curves to the right or reduced, reduces the affinity of hemoglobin for oxygen is the Bohr effect, which describes PCO2 and increased acidity. So more carbon dioxide, more acid, lower pH. So it's a really silly mistake, but a lot of people actually get increased acidity and high pH mixed up. So it's, um, be careful in your exams because they like to play with the words. Increased temperature also shifts it to the right. And these are the other factors that shift it to the right as well. If you have the slides, I've expanded on these points in the bottom. So the converse is true. If you decrease PCO2, you decrease acidity, increase pH, decrease temperature, you will shift the curve to the left. So if you look at the curve again, if you shift to the left for the same um, um, PO2, you would have a higher O2 saturation because it has an increased affinity. So applicability in the body, in the lungs, you have low CO2, high pH, low temperature. Hence, the curve shifts to the left and the affinity for O2 increases to facilitate O2 uptake. At the same time, you want to know that in the lungs, there is also a higher PO2. So the higher PO2 means that it is higher on the curve as well. So it's not just shifting the curve, it also acts along the curve. So there's two things, okay? So the low CO2, high pH, low temperature will shift the curve. It will shift the curve to the left and increase the affinity. At the same time, you have a higher PO2 in your lung, which allows you to have a higher O2 set. 
So in the tissue, that's the opposite. You have high CO2, low pH, high temperature, and the curve shifts right, not cure, curve shifts right, and infinity for O2 decreases, and this facilitates O2 release. At this point, does anyone have any questions? Okay. So, I'll go on to talk about the transport of CO2. So it's important to note that CO2 um, is transported not only by one thing, like in oxygen, which is only transported mainly by hemoglobin. CO2 tends to be transported by the plasma, bicarbonate, and this thing called carbine. Carbe I can't pronounce it, read it. Okay, so this is the important formula which you need to recognize. CO2 plus H2O uh, with the catalyst carbonic anhydrase inside the red blood cell basically becomes carbonic acid which then ionizes to form HCO3 and H+. So HCO3 is how most of the carbon dioxide is uh, carried about in the body. So what's important to note is that this reaction is a reversible reaction. So if you remember high school science, Le Chatelier's principle, yeah, there we go. And um, carbonic anhydrase is within red blood cells. So at the lungs, HCO3 must re-enter the red blood cells to be converted back to CO2 to be released. So it's floating around as the ion, as HCO3 minus. Once it reaches the lungs, it goes back into the red blood cells, gets reverse reaction, so it goes back all the way to CO2 with the help of carbonic anhydrase. It's also important to note this equation to understand how CO2 can lead to uh, more acid in the blood. As you can see, H plus is right there. Okay, so this is the CO2-HB dissociation curve. It's similar in concept to that of the oxygen dissociation curve but it is different, okay? And it's different because it has a narrower operating range, and it's also different because it's describing a totally different compound. So it's important to know the difference between the Haldane effect and the Bohr's effect. So um, it's quite irritating that a lot of people tend to just describe it as the opposite of the Bohr's effect. To me, it's not really the opposite because you're describing apples and oranges, in this case, oxygen and uh, carbon dioxide. It's important to know that Haldane is used to describe the CO2 HB dissociation curve and Bohr is used to describe oxygen. So high PO2 promotes the unloading of CO2 from hemoglobin and low PO2 promotes the loading of O2 into hemoglobin. So this, for example, is in the lung, where in the lung you have a high PO2, therefore CO2 is easily unloaded. And in the lung you have a low PO2, PCO2, and therefore you have increased loading of O2 into hemoglobin. So it's just to get your um, definitions right, Haldane is used to describe the loading and unloading of CO2, Bohr is used to describe that of oxygen, okay? It is not truly an opposite. Okay, so control of respiration, this table looks really scary, but I can tell you for sure that this won't come out for your examinations, or these, um, I think it won't. Um, the only thing that I want to point out is the dorsal respiratory group. So this is basically the final point in which everything acts upon to control your respiration, or at least most of them act upon to control respiration, and basically controls the rhythm of breathing by controlling the rate of inspiration. Okay, so this is the rough function. Uh, control of respiration. So you have your central and your peripheral chemoreceptors. So central chemoreceptors, um, control minute to minute control of breathing and um, they increase breathing um, in response to low pH in the cerebrospinal fluid. This is important to note, low pH in cerebrospinal fluid. And the mechanism for this is because HCO3 and H plus are ions and cannot cross the blood brain barrier. So um, only CO2 can pass through. So what CO2 does is that it passes through the blood-brain barrier, it dissolves in your cerebrospinal fluid, and this then forms H plus and HCO3 minus, and H plus is then detected by central chemoreceptors. So if you have too high a P, too high acidity, so there's a too high concentration of H plus or a low pH, um, you will have an increase in your respiratory rate. And your peripheral chemoreceptors, so these control breathing mainly when O2 takes over CO2 as a controller of respiration. So this is basically found in your carotid and aortic bodies. 
and they respond to low PO2, high CO2, and low pH. However, the sensitivity to low PO2 only commences below 60 mmHg because before that, your central chemoreceptors are dominant. Okay, so the response to high pCO2 is, has a smaller um, effect compared to that of your central chemoreceptors again. So remember, central chemoreceptors are dominant until oxygen goes below 60 mmHg. So last of all, this is just a fun fact. Low pH, uh, which is detected by peripheral chemoreceptors, you might think, oh, it's another thing that's that is quite similar to your central chemoreceptors. But central chemoreceptors only pick up low pH in response to high CO2, whereas the pH sensors in peripheral chemoreceptors can detect, pH, can detect H plus due to other sources as well, such as lactic acidosis um, and other um, acid-producing um, um, mechanisms in the body. And these are just some of the other receptors which, ha which appears. Okay, so... Sorry? Okay, yeah, so I won't be going through this. So I'll just be skipping through this part. Did, did you have any mention whether this would be on the exams? It's not accessible? Cool, go and read Kelvin's post, guys. So basically, you're really interested. The, pet, the physiology behind this is really interesting. So for those with free time, please do look at the slides. Okay, so this is the important one that people always get confused about. So I'll be going through this. So pulmonary function tests, you have three main tests, guys. Thank you. So you have spirometry, lung volume, and TLCO, or also known as DLCO. So remember, you have three main pulmonary function tests. Spirometry, lung volume tests, and your DL or TLCO. And note that in the hospitals, try to use PFT instead of LFTs, because LFTs in the hospital usually stands for liver. Okay, so spirometry is the best test we have so far and is the most commonly used. It's the most readily available and useful pulmonary function test. So this is how you interpret a spirometry. First step, you elect you evaluate FEV1 over FVC. So the only thing that this tells you is whether this is an obstructive or non-obstructive picture. So if it's less than 80%, it is considered obstructive. Um, they might also give you less than, the fifth, less than the fifth lower limit of normal, and that's just another way they define the 80%. So after that, you've, um, if let's say FEV1 of FVC is obstructive, then you'll look at FEV1 to find out the degree of obstruction. So FEV1 tells you degree of obstruction, whereas FEV1 of FVC just gives you a yes, no answer. Is it obstructive or not obstructive? And so if FEV1 is less than 80, you have uh, mild, mild um, obstruction, and the lower FEV1 gets, the, um, the more severe the obstruction is. So if it's not obstructive, uh, if FEV1 of FVC is normal, look at FVC. If FVC is less than 80, it either means a restrictive, it usually indicates a restrictive picture. So this is just a table to help you illustrate that. So FVC, if FVC is low, restrictive picture. FEV1 of FVC is low, obstructive picture. And after you diagnose an obstructive picture, look at FEV1, because FEV1 will tell you the degree of obstruction, how bad the obstruction actually is. And in the mixed picture, you basically get um, a combination of both. Oh yes, and note that 80% is only used for Monash exams. In hospitals, they tend to use 70 sometimes, or use the fifth percentile as abnormal. Okay, so after you found an obstructive picture, you want to differentiate between asthma and COPD, which are the two main obstructive diseases that you have. So how you do that is by doing a post-bronchodilator test. So after you take the first barometry, you say, oh, hey, this guy has an uh, obstructive picture. What you want to do is to try and treat him to see whether it improves with asthma treatment. And if there's an improvement, you can be quite sure to say that there is a um, picture of asthma over COPD. 
So 10 to 15 minutes after your salbutamol administration, you repeat your spirometry, and this is the criteria which you need to all note down. If there is an increase in FEV1 by 12%, and, 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 I can't emphasize and more than I can already now. Um, it's not all, it's and. Increase in FEV1 or greater than two, 0.2 liters, it suggests asthma, okay? So you need to have two criteria to, to, um, to be suggestive of asthma. And this is because in a lung which is really, really small, even after you give the bronchodilator, you might have a huge percentage increase, but the actual increase that actually happened is so minimal that it won't be significant enough to diagnose asthma. So lung volume tests, so it's usually ordered when you have a decreased FVC, when you have a restrictive picture, but people also order it for COPD. Um, how you do it is usually by body pathismography, it's the gold standard. Other important methods include helium dilution, which they may just word drop on you in one of the MCQ questions. So note, helium dilution can be used to measure lung volume. And these are the important formulas, which you need to know. So to explain this to you, some basic concepts, volumes are measured, capacities are calculated. So they are the addition of all the volumes to form capacities, volumes are measured physically. So vital capacity is basically your ability to stay alive, basically. So that includes your IRV, TV and ERV. So TV is your tidal volume, ERV is your um, expiratory residual volume, IRV is your inspiratory residual volume. And the formulas, um, important ones to note would be your um, vital capacity. You need to understand that because that is the capacity which you can control. So that's why it's your vital capacity is the ability of yourself to control how much air you have inside. And TLCs, well, that's quite self-explanatory. It's basically everything added together. FRC might be a bit um, harder to understand, but if you look at the graph, you can see that it's actually um, the end, um, the expiratory residual volume plus the residual volume. And residual volume, like I mentioned earlier, is the amount of air that's remaining in your lungs after full expiration, and that it may or may not still be able to undergo gas exchange. And that is the one that differentiates it in concept from dead space. Okay, so this is not too important. I put it here for you guys just to look at. Um, it's quite, if you look at it slowly, you can kind of understand it. You have gas trapping, so you have more air trapped in your lungs. So therefore, residual volume increases. At the end of, at the end of expiration, you have more air trapped in your lungs, so gas trapping. Hyperinflation, um, basically your total lung capacity increases. And so basically hyperinflation basically means that you're simply breathing at a higher lung volume to reduce airway resistance. So when you breathe at a higher lung volume, you have an increase in the diameter of your bronchioles. So therefore, if you increase in diameter, you reduce resistance and therefore you allow for easier airflow. Over this, hyperinflation with over distension is um, both decreasing your resistance to increase airflow resistance at the same time, there's also an element of loss of elastic recoil. So this is usually seen in emphysema where you have um, um, loss of the elastin within the lung and you have um, loss of um, elasticity of the lung. I'll be going through this later in COPD. Uh, restrictive picture, you might think of it as if you're wearing a belt over your lung, over your chest, and basically your lung is just compressed and becomes very small. So your VC and TLC are both decreased. TLCO, um, not really that important too. Um, basically, it describes to you um, any diffusion problems in your lung. So you have a restrictive picture. You might want to think of intrinsic or non-intrinsic lung disease. Non-intrinsic lung disease can include things like kyphosis, lordosis, scoliosis. So things on the outside which compress your lung. Intrinsic lung disease can be things like pulmonary uh, fibrosis. So this is when you have a thickening of the lung membrane and therefore slower diffusion and therefore reduced TLCO. So after you have spirometry, which shows you a restrictive picture, so FVC less than 80%, you do a TLCO and it tells you whether or not you have pulmonary fibrosis or whether you have something that is not due to pulmonary fibrosis. That's what basically it tells you. In an obstructive picture wise, you can have um, emphysema. So emphysema, you get rid of the um, 
the walls of the alveoli, the septal connections. And so basically, if you reduce surface area, you have reduced rate of diffusion and therefore reduced TLCL. So it helps you differentiate emphysema from other causes of obstruction as well. However, you want to note that other things can also affect TLCO, and these should be in your differentials when you receive a low TLCO. That's all you need to know. Okay, so last PST which I want to go through is the bronchal provocation challenge. So earlier we went through the post bronchal dilator challenge. So the difference in this is that now you're trying to cause asthma, whereas in the other case you're trying to heal their asthma. So this is usually used in asymptomatic patients, so patients who are not currently asthmatic. So even if you give them a bronchodilator, um, you can't really improve their lung function much. So what you want to do in these patients is to make it worse and therefore diagnose asthma. That's the gist of it. So we go on to obstructive lung diseases. Would you guys like a short break? Or do you want me just to push through? Okay, cool. Okay, so we have obstructive lung diseases. Um, okay, so we have asthma and COPD. Actually, hold on. Never mind. Okay, so this is the definition of asthma. Uh, you can classify asthma as uh, atopic or non-atopic, so extrinsic or intrinsic asthma. Intrinsic asthma usually includes aspirin or exercise-induced asthma. They tend to be more severe, and they are more severe due to hyper-responsive airways that have non-specific bronchial hyperactivity. Whereas atopic asthma, you kind of know what you're allergic to and you can avoid those stimuli. So atopic asthmas also tend to be the more common ones. So asthma can be split into four things. Uh, the, the pathogenesis can be split to four things. You have airway inflammation, airway obstruction, airway remodeling, and the last one, which I'm not going to go through. So airway inflammation, this is where I'm trying to incorporate your immunology into it. So you have your early response and your late response. So early response-wise, you have T-cell cytokine response to allergens. So this is when your Th2 uh, CD4 helper T-cells produce IL-4, 5, 13. You don't need to actually know these uh, numbers. Uh, so basically what these cytokines do is they activate B cells to produce IgE. IgE you do need to know. So IgE is the um, allergen or the uh, helminthic, so that's worms, um, immunoglobulin. And this activates mast cells and isonophils to produce histamines, uh, among other cytokines. And basically what histamine does, it causes smooth muscle contraction and increased mucus secretion. So therefore, you can treat this with beta agonists like your salbutamol because you are treating bronchodilation because at this point in time, the airway obstruction is caused by smooth muscle contraction. So in non-asthmatics, you have your Th2 CD4 helper T cells, and um, these produce some other cytokines like uh, interferon gamma, which causes your B cells to produce IgG instead of IgE. So IgE is, is the abnormal response, IgG is the normal response. And so in your late response, basically you have recruitment of your inflammatory and immune cells. So basically what this means is that uh, the bronco, the bronco uh, sorry, the airway obstruction is no longer caused so much by airway, um, by the smooth muscle contraction, but it's rather caused more by um, edema, okay? Edema of the walls. So therefore, in a late response, uh, your salbutamol might not work as, effic as effectively anymore. So airway obstruction, you can think of it as smooth muscle contraction, bronchial hyperresponsiveness, and increased mucus production and edema. So like I said, airway smooth muscle contraction can be treated by salbutamol, and it's reversible, and yep, the rest you can read yourself. <clears throat> so these are the common risk factors and triggers. You have atopy and airway hyperresponsiveness, indoor allergens and outdoor allergens, among all the others. Important is to realize the difference between risk factors and triggers. So risk factors are things you use to help you diagnose asthma. Triggers are things that you kind of identify after you've already diagnosed the patient. So clinical features, clinical features you have your classic triad, you have wheeze, shortness of breath, and cough. The wheeze tends to be high-pitched and whistling, usually on expiration. And the cough is often worse at night. 
among, and all the symptoms are also worse at night. Uh, these are the other features which are not so important. You might want to take note of the past history or family history of A to P, however. So these are some of the other things that might run, that might suggest an atopic asthma. So signs include wheeze, and remember clubbing is not a feature of asthma and it's not a feature of COPD, okay? And these are some of the other signs as well. So anything in grey in my lecture slides are basically not as important. I forgot to mention this at the start. Uh, anything in red is super important. Anything in black is kind of important. Okay, so asthma diagnosis. So you need a compatible clinical history plus your positive bronchodilator uh, test. So that is more than 12% increase and more than 0.2 liters increase. And these are some of the other tests that you can do and some other ways to diagnose asthma which you don't need to know. Okay, so asthma treatment wise, First of all, you do lifestyle. Can anyone give me any suggestions of how you improve asthma? Yeah, questionable, don't exercise. Of course, if you have too little um, respiratory function, then yes. Yes, avoiding triggers. So yes, that's one important one. Anyone else? Yes, don't smoke. That is one of the most important ones. So yes, smoking cessation and avoiding triggers. Other things include vaccination, which is really important, and asthma action plans as well. And um, some patients also undergo peak respiratory flow rate monitoring at home. So pharmacological um, methods include a stepwise approach. So this includes your SABAS. So first you start off with a short acting um, beta agonist. So that's your salbutamol. You add your inhaled corticosteroids. If that still doesn't work, you add your LABA. If that still doesn't work, you increase your ICS dosage. And if that doesn't work, you can move on to your oral corticosteroids. In some guidelines, they might also ask to, inc to consider anti-IgE. So this is omaluzumab. So this is a very um, good and new drug, which is given to severe asthmatics and basically it controls IgE production so that your beta cells, um, so that your mast cells do not react to IgE and do not produce histamines. So this is just a diagram to show it. So this is the mechanism of action of salbutamol and LABA. Um, you don't need to go into that much detail. Just remember that SAWAS and LABAs basically cause less, in, less calcium release and therefore muscle relaxation, because with more calcium, you cause contraction. So glucocorticoids-wise, we have transactivation and transrepression. So this is just revision from last year. These are keywords that are always dropped in MCQs. So make sure you are aware of transactivation and transrepression. Adverse effects of SABA and LABA include all your sympathetic overdrive. So tachycardia, muscle tremors are the most important, and tolerance with overuse. So desensitization to link back to year one pharmacogenetics, if you guys even remember that lecture. Um, what Richard told us was that people with the, pheno with the genotype of ARG, ARG, have a greater chance of getting desensitized to salbutamol. And yeah, the important thing to note is that LABAs must always be given with an ICS because they mask the symptoms of inflammation but ICS can be given without a LABA. And also note that inhaled ICS has very few side effects, uh, much less than that of oral glucocorticoids. Inhaled ICS, um, the only two side effects which are commonly seen are dysphonia, which is like hoarseness of voice, and oral candidiasis. So it's important to teach patients that after taking ICS, they should gargle their mouth to get rid of any excess. So other things to note is combination treatment between your LABA and ICS. So many a times, um, because these patients are usually old, they have a bit of memory problems, they don't know how to take two different puffers. So what they have done now is to combine the two. And so we have serotide and Symbicort, and how I remember what makes up serotide and Symbicort, which you need to know, by the way. Uh, one core drug plus one non-core drug. Does that make sense? So Pluticasone is your core drug. Salmeterol is not a core drug, so that makes up serotide. Symbicort, budesonide is not a core drug. Ifometerol is a core drug, so 
that makes Simbicort. And these are just some of the other drugs which are used. So COPD, um, I don't know about you, but when I was in year two, I was quite um, irritated that COPD was not taught very well. Um, so basically, this is the definition of COPD. You need to understand that COPD tends to be irreversible, okay, and that it's progressive, so it gets worse and worse and worse with time. And there are three main subtypes to COPD. There's chronic bronchitis, emphysema, and chronic asthma. So in chronic bronchitis, you must have a productive cough for more than three months for two consecutive years. And emphysema, that's a pathological, um, histological kind of diagnosis, you must have enlarged air spaces, although you might be able to see this on CT as well. So if you look at the Venn diagram that I provided at the bottom, you can see how COPD is actually made up of um, these three diseases and um, how they have overlapped with each other as well. Okay, and COPD is basically the shaded area. So the pathogenesis of COPD um, is mainly caused by smoking. So what smoking does is that it causes epithelial death in two ways. We have direct oxidant-induced death, so that is when the smoke itself causes oxidation and therefore death. And we also have immune cell recruitment, which basically means it recruits immune cells to produce elastase, which basically damage the lungs. And a cool experiment which was done was basically when they, um, they basically put rats in a cage and they put hell a lot of smoke in there. And what they did was they removed the component of elastase, and basically these rats did not develop COPD. So elastase is a very important component, and it is um, up and coming in the drug industry to which they're trying to target. So there's limited ability of the lung to repair these damaged alveoli, and therefore these damages tend to be permanent, and that is what you see in emphysema. So pathology-wise, you have hypertrophy of your mucus-secreting cells, so that means more mucus, more cough and you have squamous cell metaplasia. So that, it changes your pseudocolumnar epithelial, um, pseudocolumnar ciliated epithelium, and it changes it to that of squamous cells, so they lose their cilia. So you can no longer get rid of this increased mucus, which is caused by hypertrophy of the mucus secreting cells. And also squamous cells are more um, predisposed to lung cancers as well, so you have squamous cell lung cancers. So the pathophysiology, you've got airflow obstruction, hyperinflation and gas exchange. So basically, airflow obstruction is caused by a lot of elastin, which reduces the elasticity of the lung and makes it harder to collapse. And in hyperinflation, basically the hyperinflation, when you destroy the elastin in the lung, um, so remember I told you the lung pulls in, chest pulls out. So if your lung loses elasticity, it stops pulling in as strongly. So what happens is that the chest wall will then pull it out further. So that is why you have hyperinflation. And hyperinflation, I call it compensatory because it helps the patient in two ways. So one way is when you have more air in your lungs, your airways are wider, they have less resistance, airflow is easier. Second reason why you have increased lung um, volume, increased, you get hyperinflation, is imagine if I have five rubber bands and if I were to take away so this is the normal function of the five rubber bands. If let's say um, I were to take away three, for the same distance that I expand, I will produce less force. Is that right? So you want to produce the same amount of force in order to push out the same amount of air. So what hyperinflation does is, it stretches the elastin to a wider um, distance so that they produce the same amount of force to push out the same amount of air. Okay, so hyperinflation, I see again, has two compensatory methods. It causes an increase in your alveolar diameter so that you have less resistance and you have easier flow of air through that. At the same time, it also stretches your elastin so that they have more elastic recoil. And you don't actually need to take notes. I will just upload these slides which have all the notes at the bottom. And, um, however, with too much hyperinflation, it's also a bad thing because it compresses your diaphragm. So when your diaphragm is compressed, you can generate less negative intrapleural pressures and therefore um, um, it's a double-edged sword. Okay, so that's COPD in a nutshell.
Clinical features include exertional dyspnea, so there's dyspnea with worse, worse, worsened on exertion or movement. You have cough and sputum production. Signs include general signs like loss of weight, tripod signs, so that's when you lean forward to try and secure yourself to breathe in easier. Pursed lip breathing, cyanosis. You've got things like your um, red puffers and uh, blue bloaters, or blue bloaters are more characteristic of chronic uh, bronchitis, and red puffers are more characteristic of emphysema. You have prolonged expiration. Hoover sign. So Hoover sign is when you put your hands around your um, anterior chest wall, and when you breathe in, you will basically see your thumbs going in. Whereas if you try it on yourself, your thumbs should actually move out. So in COPD, it's a, not a very common sign, but when you ask the patient to inspire, their thumb, your thumbs will actually move in. So that's one sign of COPD. Another thing you have is increased anterior posterior chest diameter. So this is caused by hyperinflation and you, um, it's seen as a barrel shaped chest. You also have exteresis, which is caused by high CO2. And clubbing, as I say again, is not a sign of COPD. So you have hyperresonance on percussion and you have decreased breath sounds, weasels, and crackles. So to diagnose COPD, um, you need to have symptoms characteristic of COPD, and you need to have a negative uh, bronchodilator test. So the treatment of stable COPD, um, there are many, many permutations to how to treat COPD. So I recommend you just open a lecture and follow whatever, who gave you this lecture? Well, well, whoever taught you this lecture. So this is the one from my year. I'm not sure if the same slide as you, but um, in general, what you would like to do is to stop smoking. That is the best thing the patient can do. That's the one with the best mortality benefits. And the other thing with mortality benefit is O2 home therapy. Pharmacologically wise, you can start with a SAMA, which is your epitropium. So these are short acting muscarinic antagonists. And or your um, SABA, which is your salbutamol. And if you're in the USA, you can start considering the use of thiophylline, but that's not commonly used in, in Australia because of severe side effects. So then you can add a LABA or a LAMA. So LABAs are your long-acting, so these are your ephemeterols, and your long-acting muscarinic ant antagonists, so these are your teotropium. So if that is still not effective, you add ICS. And... By the slides, after ICS, you can also choose to add an oral um, corticosteroid as well. Or if you are in a, more, um, you're in a bigger hospital, you can also send your patient for lung surgery. So this will actually cure your COPD. So you can take out the dysfunctioning lung or you can replace a lung. Of course, there are uh, restrictions to that because it's restricted by the amount of lungs that you actually have. Okay, so... COPD, uh, these are the drugs. So these are the, some of the important ones you need to take note of. Tyotropium is not too important for your level. Um, take note of ipratropium, that's important. And take note of xanthine drugs and how it stabilizes mast cells. And also note how thiophylline is really, really, really poisonous and it produces tons of side effects. So restrictive lung diseases, I kind of went through this earlier, but I won't be going through much about it. So these are the URTIs. Uh, frankly, at your level, it's just memorizing a few lists. Um, so URTIs are defined by infections that are from the nose to the pharynx. So anything after the pharynx is considered a lower respiratory tract infection. So the things you need to take note of are the common cold, usually caused by the rhinovirus. Annual influenza is caused by influenza B. And big epidemic influenza is caused by influenza A. Can anyone tell me antigen shift happens in which influenza? A, okay. And B does antigen. Okay, cool. So you guys got the concept pretty well. And how I remember is that um, if, let's say, a person has lots of time to go drifting with their car, they're not going to get an A. But, yeah. <laughs> so we also have your otitis externus. So they're usually caused by Staph aureus. So more severe ones like necrotizing otitis and acute diffuse otitis external. So diffuse basically means more than one spot. So it's all over the otitis externa. The more severe ones tend to be caused by this thing called Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And this is a really nasty bug because it basically necrotizes living tissue. And 
Acute sore throat is usually viral, and if it's really severe, it can cause it can be caused by strep pyogenes, and strep pyogenes is also known as the uh, bug, which causes rheumatic fever. So, in, I am infectious motor nucleotis, also known as glandular fever, also known as Kissing's fever, is caused by the Epstein Barr virus. Quincy is caused by bacterial staph or strep, and croup is caused by your para influenza virus, and pertussis is caused by Bordetella pertussis. Some of these are quite um, self explanatory because the name of the disease is inside the name of the bacteria. So the ones with the red arrows are the more important ones. The ones that don't have arrows are just the ones which I included in the past when I was in year two. So the common treatments, just remember, unless there's a strong indication, there's a strong sign that there's bacterial infection, if you see yellow pus, green pus, uh, sputum, you will not give um, Unless you see those, you will not give any antibacterials. So most of the time, it's usually just pain and fever relief. So it's NSAIDs, paracetamol, nasal sprays. And the only one I want to bring your attention to is otitis externa, because this one includes a combined therapy between an antimicrobial, so this can be an antifungal, and it can be an antibacterial, plus corticosteroid ear drops. So this is important, corticosteroid ear drops. Um, other than that, most of the time, they just give them amoxicillin if they really see any um, bacterial infection. So I move on to your lower respiratory tract infections. So these are the ones that you need to know. Again, red arrow is important. No red arrow is not so important. Acute bronchitis is usually viral. Pneumonia, community acquired wise, is usually caused by streptococcus pneumoniae. In exams, they can use the term pneumococcal as well. So pneumococcal is just the informal name for streptococcus pneumoniae, and they are basically the same thing. Um, tuberculosis like the, is caused by mycobacterium tuberculosis. Cystic fibrosis is not actually an infectious disease, but it is commonly, um, um, it commonly bears um, bacteria. And the one that's most important, again, is Pseudomonas aeruginosa because that is the one that causes necrotism. So these are the common treatments. Again, symptomatic treatment, unless you see bacteria, then you give them antibiotics. Um, if you see pertussis, you use macrolides, so that's your erythromycin. Influenza-wise, you can give them oseltamivir, which is a neuraminase inhibitor. This is important, neuraminase inhibitor, oseltamivir. So it prevents the release of your progeny virus. So um, for now, it's still important, but there's increasing number of studies which show that also Telmavir is a useless drug because it simply reduces the duration of your fever from seven to, I think, 6.3 days. So they are questioning whether paying for the drug is worth the 0 0.7 days of uh, better symptoms. So, but for now, you can still give the drug to patients. Pneumonia-wise, you want to give amoxicillin, and you can at doxycycline or single agent macrolide if you see mycoplasma pneumonia. The important one I want to bring attention to is tuberculosis. So this is the one you must memorize. It's the RIPE treatment. So it stands for rifampicin, isoniazid, pyrazinamide, and ethambutol. So these are the four drugs you need to know for tuberculosis treatment. Yep. Yeah, I'm almost there. Yeah. So clinical skills, we have just a few graphs for you to look at. So we have this graph here. Again, those with arrows are the more important ones. If you see a barking cough, it's usually pertussis or croup. If you have a hollow bovine cough, it's usually a recurrent laryngeal nerve problem. If you have, and these are the two most important ones for your coughs. So you need to differentiate between a barking cough and a hollow bovine cough. So hollow bovine cough, recurrent laryngeal nerve problem. So basically, um, your vocal cords are denovated, and therefore your cough sounds hollow and bovine. Um, croup and pertussis presents with barking cough, it's usually seen in younger patients. Asthma-wise, it's usually a dry cough, sometimes productive, and the key word here is worse at night. So you see, worse at night equals asthma for year two. Pneumonia-wise, you might have a dry or productive cough. Bronchiectasis, the thing to recognize about bronchiectasis is very productive cause. So bronchiectasis is a permanent dilatation of your, of your bronchioles. 
And so basically what you have in this scenario is a very, very productive cough that is chronic. So the other important thing to note is the dry, scratchy, persistent cough. So that's the characteristic of ACE inhibitors. So can anyone tell me if you have a dry, uh, dry cough with ACE inhibitors, what would you like to give the patient next? Yes, so you get them ups. Okay, so next thing I want to go through is hemoptysis. So these are the sound differentials you need to know, all of which are important. Um, pneumonia usually presents with blood streaks, sputum, so there's a little bit of blood inside. Bronchial carcinomas tend to present with more blood, and that's because in cancers, your blood vessels are new blood vessels, they're formed really quickly, so they're very, very vulnerable to even the slightest bit of trauma. So when these rupture, they cause um, usually a lot of blood that comes out with cough. Um, yeah. So these are just for your perusal, not likely important. Um, reduced breath sounds are important because if you have reduced breath sounds, it's usually indicative of COPD or atelectasis. Uh, if you have early inspiratory crackles, okay, so crackles can be split into early and late. More importantly is the late inspiratory crackles. You have fine, medium, and coarse. So fine is usually due to pulmonary fibrosis. Medium is usually due to left ventricular um, failure, so that is due to uh, backflow of the uh, blood to your lungs, which causes pulmonary edema. And in course, you can think of uh, infectious causes. So anything infectious will have coarse crabs. Anything that is um, fibrose will have fine crabs. Anything with pulmonary edema will have medium crabs. And they use the, the word crepitation, crabs, and crackles to define the same thing. So the next thing I want to bring about is focal resonance. So you just need to know that high frequencies usually mean a consolidation. So consolidation just basically means a solid lump there. And uh, it's usually bleating, so it sounds like a sheep. So it, it's supposed to sound like 99 or something like that, yeah. <laughs> so that's basically how it sounds like. And I provided you guys a link at the bottom. I will upload the slides again later on easyauscultation.com for you to actually listen to the sounds. So these are just some of the other diseases which I think you should be aware about. Um, anything with a star is important. It's really for you to browse at home. Um, yeah. And in this one, tuberculosis is the only one that I want to go through. So tuberculosis, remember you can have weight loss, night sweats, and melee. So night sweats is your keyword. You see any Indian person, you see any Vietnamese person, any person from Southeast Asia that comes up in your exams, these patients always have tuberculosis. Okay? For Monash standards, anyone who comes from anywhere apart from Australia have tuberculosis. <laughs> so, they'll drop in a few other hints as well. They'll drop in words like night sweats, they have cough, blood with their cough, that is usually a sign of tuberculosis. And on the chest x-ray, you will see uh, granulomatous consolidations in the apex of the lungs, usually. So I'll just be going to chest x-ray's interpretation. So this is just my way of remembering it. I, Q, R, I, P, A, D. So basically, I stands for identity. Q stands for quality, so rotation, inspiration, and penetration. So can anyone tell me how you tell whether an image is rotated? Yes, so you look at the clavicles, I heard the answer somewhere there. And if it's equidistant from the sternum, it is not rotated. Other than that, you can also look for um, adequate inspiration. So anyone knows how to tell whether an x-ray is well, whether the patient has well inspiration? Okay, and how many ribs? It's nine. Okay, so it's nine ribs, nine posterior ribs to diagnose uh, to see whether he has proper inspiration. And D stands for, um, oh, sorry, P stands for penetration. So you look at the vertebral, um, the, vert the vertebra behind the cardiac shadow. Okay, so A stands for any artifacts, and D stands for ob describe obvious defects. Because if you see like a huge pleural effusion, you're not gonna go to A, B, C, D, and then tell me there's an effusion. You just tell me there's an effusion, and then you go to A, B, C, D, E. Okay, so A stands for airways, so you look for any deviation of the trachea. You might also be able to see any um, carinal widening, but it's usually quite hard to see. Um, apart from that, 
you move on to bones and breast shadow. So bones, you look for smooth bones. You look for whether or not there's rough edges which can indicate a fracture. Breast shadow is just there to uh, impress your examiner that you know that this person is a female. Cardiac-wise, you need to look out for cardiomegaly. So that's when your cardiac um, size is more than half of your inter-rib diameter. And you look at the diaphragm. You look for whether or not there is a um, raised diaphragm or whether your diaphragm has been denovated. You look for air beneath the diaphragm, which is signs of a perforated bowel. On E, you look for effusions. So effusions, again, you look for costal diaphragmatic angles. You look for meniscus sign. You look for white out of the lung. F, you look for fields, so you look for any consolidations, any masses, any nodules. You look for any, um, um, the hyalur signs as well. And then you look at the gastric bubble. The gastric bubble uh, is just below the uh, diaphragm in the stomach on the left side. And you look at the hilum and you look at the lymph nodes of the hilum and you look for instrumentation such as ECG leads. So these are just conditions to recognize. And thank you very much. I've come to the end.